Hey everyone, we're going to look at another dynamic programming question. The problem is called Walrus Weights and it is based on an MP problem called the subset sum problem. If you don't know what an MP problem is, don't worry, you can Google that later. But roughly speaking, it's a problem without any efficient solution. So often the only way to get a solution is by trying every possible combination. In other words, using brute force. And before moving on, a few people told me that I should make shorter videos because the ones on recursive backtracking and dummy programming, they're getting really long. I think they're all up for 30 minutes, which I think is fair enough because they are still beginner videos and sometimes I explain things very slowly. But I'm going to try to split this video because this problem is similar to the group sum problem that we've done earlier. So I will start with discussing how to do group sum using dummy programming and then we'll start on walrus weights in the next video. You can of course just watch the two videos back to back, or if you think that this one is going to be trivial for you, then just skip this one and watch the second one. Anyway, back to the problem. I mentioned that we're basically going to be doing the subset sum problem. The basic version of the subset sum is this. Given an integer t and a set of integers s, can you find a subset of s that will sum up to t? For example, if t is 10 and s is minus 2, 2, 4, 6, 12, then the answer is yes because 4 plus 6 is 10 and so is 12 plus minus 2. There can be many variations of this question. For example, instead of a set, you can have a multiset where each integer can be chosen more than once. We can also put restrictions on the set. For example, we can make it so that only positive numbers are in the set. Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, this was actually the first problem that I did on recursive backtracking. It was a question called group sum. So if you haven't seen that video yet, I recommend that you do. I'll put a link in the video description. Or if you want to skip that video, then at least I need you to already know how to solve this problem using recursive backtracking. I'm going to start with our solution for the group sum problem because I want to show you just how slow it actually is. Mind you, even though this is slow, it's not like you wasted our time constructing the solution because it was a very good question for learning how to do recursive backtracking. It's just that now we know about dynamic programming, which we can use to improve our solution. And to show you just how good dynamic programming is, I want to show you how slow our old solution is in comparison. So this is the exact same code that I wrote in the group sum video, or at least it should be very close to it. And running this with the array minus 2, 2, 4, 6, 12, and target being 10, I'll get a yes or a true. Let's try to run that. Yep, I got a true. So if I change that into 11, I won't be able to get 11 with that array. I'll get a false. I'm now going to change the size of the input and to keep it simple, I use an array of size n containing numbers from 1 to n. So let's say n is equal to 20 for now. Let's make a new array of size n and have a for loop. I'm just going to set nums i to i plus 1. And for the target, Hmm, let's just make it to be the sum of all the numbers from 1 to n. So that is given by n times n plus 1 divided by 2. This is something you can Google easily. I also made a video discussing this formula actually, so maybe I'll find a link and put it in, this, um, in the video description. So we're going to start with n equal to 20 for now. I'm going to try to run this. The answer is going to be true. And that's pretty quick. So why don't we record the time that it takes to finish the codes? Um, I'm not sure if I have shown you how to do this, uh, but it's quite simple. I'm going to record the start time. So long start is equal to system dot current to current time in second and the end time. And we're just going to print out n minus start, which is going to be the running time in millisecond. So time plus n minus start. Um, I'll just keep it at millisecond. Okay, so let's run that. It took four milliseconds. <laughs> That's pretty fast. 
So let me increase that to 30. Oh, that's taking a while longer. 2.3 seconds. So if I go to 32, how long will this take? Hmm, a bit long. Anyway, as you can see here, uh, we're doing brute force, which is why it can take a while for the program to finish, to, to find a solution, because we are evaluating a lot of cases. I hope you remember that this is what the tree looks like. For each element in the array, we can either pick it or not pick it. So if we have four elements, there are two to four, that is 16 combinations. And if you have 32 elements, you have 2 to the power of 32, which is around 2 billion combinations. So that's a lot of recursive call that we're making. Now, I'm going to make one change, and let's see if you can work out why the code will run much faster after I make that change. So I'm going to swap these two recursive calls. So the left side is where I do not pick the array element. And I'm going to change that so I actually picked the array element. And this one becomes just target. So remember, this took about 9 seconds to run with n equal to 32. And if I run it now, it should be much faster. Yes, it took 0 millisecond, so that's way better. If I change n into something bigger, like 40, it should also take 0 seconds as well. Um, let me make one more change. See the target there? If I change the target to n times n plus 1 divided by 2, so the sum of numbers from 1 to n, and I add 1 to it, this will now take a long time to finish. So let's go back to 32, run it again. Uh, it took about 9 seconds, right? I'm guessing this will also take about 9 seconds. 8 seconds. And I'm not going to try doing 40 because that will take forever to finish. But this time, of course, the answer is false because we can't get the sum, well, we can't get target plus 1. As in, target was the sum of numbers from 1 to n, and we just add 1 to it, there's no way we can make that sum. We don't have enough numbers. So can you see why um, if target is equal to the sum of numbers, can you see why this is much faster? Well, if we look at our tree, since our target is the sum of all the numbers in the array, the only time we'll get a true is when we pick every number in the array. So that would be this node here. You see, on a free level, we either take the number or we don't. And if we keep on taking the number, because of the way we recurse, we actually go left first here, because we always pick the number first. We'll keep on going deeper and deeper until we get to the node that returns true. This one here. Now, if we look at the code, we return the left recursive call or the right recursive call. And because this one's going to return true, Java isn't going to evaluate this one because there's no point. If this is already true, true or anything is going to be true anyway. So Java is just going to start returning true all the way to the top. Of course, if you reverse this, that is by always not picking the array element first, like in the original code, then we'll be going to the other side of the tree, to this node here. And because of the way our recursion works, we'll visit every single node before we finally get to the one that will give us the right combination, which is this one here. So this is the worst case for any time because we pretty much have to visit every single node. Of course, if our target is a sum that we can't get, that will also result in the longest running time because again, we have to look at every single node. Every single node will return false and this will be written all the way to the top. So how are we going to speed this up? Well, of course, we're going to use dynamic programming. But first, can you recognize the overlapping subproblem? Because it may not be immediately obvious. For example, let's think about what subproblems we have after we've made some choices. If the set is 1, 2, 3, 4, let's say we've looked at the three numbers in the set. These are all the possible combinations. So what's the overlapping subproblem here? Because all these arrays look different. But if you look at the code again, remember, overlapping subproblem is based on the input. What's our input? Is the numbers we picked so far part of the input? 
No, it isn't. Our input is a target sum. That's target, as in how far away we are from it. And the index of the next number in the array that we should consider. Nums is just the array. It never changes. So if there are two things that make a subproblem unique, then is the start, which is the index of the um, array, and the target. These two will make the subproblem unique. So if I go back here again, go back to the tree, and I add the information about the target sum, so let's say we want to make 10 at the start, then you can see that this subproblem and this subproblem are the same. Because in both cases, we have to make 7, because our sum so far is 3. We have 1 and 2 here, and just 3 here. And in both cases, we're going to consider the number 4. So if we evaluate this subproblem, we won't have to evaluate this one. Because it doesn't matter much when you only have one more choice to go. But if there's a lot more numbers in the array, then you have to realize that these two problems are essentially the same. They're both asking, can we make 7 if you start from index 3? Let's show you another example. The array is now 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, and the target is 24. If we have considered three numbers, this is what we have. And you can see that there's enough overlap here and here, because in both cases we have 5 so far, so we have to make 19. And from this point on, we're going to ask, well, can I use 6, 7, and 8 to make 19? I'm just going to be drawing these two subtrees because I just I just don't have enough space. But hopefully it's clear that once you know the answer here, as in it's going to be false, right? Because you can't make 19 from 6, 7, 8. So you know at this point it's going to be false. And you get that by evaluating every single node in this tree here. But when you get to this point, you will have the same subproblem, as in can I make 19 from 6, 7, 8? And you've done it before you know the answer is going to be false so there's no point if you um sorry there's no point going through all these notes again so that is how we're going to find some savings that is how we're going to do the dynamic programming part okay so hopefully the overlapping subproblem is clear to you now uh it's always have i ever done this subproblem with the same exact input because if i have that means i'm not going to do it again but hopefully you can also see that now we need to have a two-dimensional lookup table because a subproblem is uniquely determined by two inputs. The sum that we have to make, that's your t here, and also the index you're at. Because if you have to start on the same index, but the sum that you have to make is different, so for example, well, everything here actually, when, uh, with t is 14, uh, and you're going to pick 6 next, that's different. That's a different problem to when t is equal to 19, even though you're going to be picking 6 next. So we're going to use a two-dimensional array to store the information. Going back to the code, I have added two new lines. The first one, line 5, declares a double array, and the second line, line 14, initialize it. So how big should the array be at the start? Well, what are the possible values of start and target? Because we need to solve the solutions for all the possible subproblems, including the initial call. So we're going to have n as one of the dimension. That one's obvious because that tells us which index of the array we're looking at, and target plus one for the other. I hope it's obvious why we need target plus one, because when doing something using DP, we should check whether or not we have done the subproblem. So. I guess that means here we have to check if dp start target has been done before. So to make sure that we don't get array out of bound exception on the initial call when target will be equal to, well, target, um, we have to make the size of the array equal to target plus one. Now you might also be wondering why did I make the dp array, an array of integers. Why not just have an array of boolean? Because each subproblem will only return true or false, right? Well, that's because our table must be able to contain three different values. True, if we have done the subproblem and get a true. False, if we have done the subproblem and get a false. And finally, another value to tell us that we haven't done the subproblem yet. 
So when I initialize an integer array in Java, the default value is zero. Therefore, I decided that zero should mean we haven't done it yet. And I'm going to use minus one to mean false and one to mean true. So I'm going to have a whole bunch of things to modify here. First, that's going to be an int. And if target is equal to zero, return true, that becomes a one. Return false, that becomes a minus one. And so now I can say, if dp star target is not equal to zero, means we have done it before, return dp star target. So I hope you can see the dynamic programming part here. This is what we always do in dynamic programming. Return the answer if we have done it before. And put this one, if we get here, that means we haven't done the problem before. So this is gonna be tp start target equal to that. And I just return dp start target. Uh, oh, it cannot be or because they're both integers. So if I get a true, that's one. If I get a false, that's minus one. If I get true or false, I want to return true, which means here I just have to return the maximum of one and minus one. Okay. So let's give this a go. Was that 32 before? Yeah, well, I'm gonna set target to be something that we can't find and now I'm going to run it. It took one millisecond, but it returns one, wait. Oh, sorry, not minus one, plus one. So we should be able to make um, n times n plus one divided by two minus one because it's just the sum of all numbers except for one. If I change that to plus, it was b minus one, and also take it took one millisecond. So let's change that to forty. It took zero millisecond. Um, to show you that I'm not I'm not cheating, let's take away some random numbers. So take away nine. Yeah, possible. Take away eight. Still possible. Um, I can't think of any other way to test this, to be honest. Well, if I add eight, I should be able to do it. You can try this on your own. Have the code and just make your own array, test it. If you're not convinced then that this is working, try it out. But this is what happens when you use DP. It took like one millisecond for something that took us, what, nine seconds, 10 seconds. I can go to like a hundred and it won't make that much of a difference. Oh, that's actually interesting. So if I have all numbers between one and hundred, I can't do, oh, sorry, of course I can't because um, n is a so, hundred now. Um, so yeah, this target, this is the maximum that we'll get if we use all the numbers in the array. So if I just add any positive number, we're guaranteed to get a minus one. So that's it. It shows you how simple it is to implement dynamic programming, or at least top-down dynamic programming. I briefly mentioned what top-down dynamic programming is, which is pretty much all we've done. In it, we always start from the top, and it's always like this. We get asked, go solve this sub-problem. Okay, have we done it before? No, then do it, and store the result somewhere. If we have done it before, then just use the result that we stored before. That's it. So this ensures that we'll only ever do the same subproblem once. Okay, that should be enough for this video. We're going to use what we learned here to construct a solution for walrus weight, the problem. We haven't even talked about the problems. We'll do that in the next video. So I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.